Finally, this morning we captured the big idol from Chief Oyen. My Senegalese boys were courageous and efficient. The whole shrine was smashed in seconds. This new idol is quite good. The hair and parts of the body are all decorated with brass upholstery tacks that are considered like jewelry here. I'm still searching for clear evidence of cannibalism, but I haven't been able to see any. The natives are very canny and hide everything. I'll never get this complicated African shit. What are you looking at? You stupid fetish. The film we just saw shows the social life of an African object. The Mager, Susan Fogel, former director of the Museum of African Art in New York, used fiction to demonstrate the different ways people in Europe and America have perceived and dealt with African art in the 20th century. The Trope Museum owns a very similar Fung sculpture. It is considered to be one of the finest examples of African art in the collection and is presented as such in the permanent Africa gallery. The museum acquired the sculpture in 1973 from Mrs. Oudshorn Spaan. She inherited the sculpture from her husband, Gijs Bertus Oudshorn, together with many other important objects. Oudshorn, who died in 1965, worked all his life at a bank, but was from an early age a passionate collector of modern art and later of art objects from Africa and Oceania. This stylish portrait of Oudshorn taken by photographer Art Klein in the early 60s, shows him with one of his favorite objects, the Fung sculpture. Oudshorn was an aesthetic collector. He chose his African art as he chose his paintings, on the aesthetic value and appeal, reflecting a strongly developed individual taste. He acquired his collection from galleries in the Netherlands and France. Although uncertain, it is believed that Oudshorn acquired this Fung sculpture in a gallery in Paris. The Fung people live in the south of nowadays Gabon in Cameroon, which was in the early 20th century a French colony. We know that this type of sculpture was used to guard a box containing the skull and bones of an important ancestor, as shown in this photograph taken in 1913. The colonial authorities repressed this ancestral cult and appropriated the objects. Not much later, they appeared on the French art market. The film and this story demonstrate the complexity of an Africa collection. Objects are loaded with stories, reflect numerous and sometimes conflicting political, economical, and cultural agendas and relations. They also show that we usually have no idea who made the sculpture and who was the first owner. The Africa collection of the Trope Museum has its own dynamics. The collection history of the last century reflects not only the complex history of Africa and the many cultural groups comprising this vast continent, but also that of the Trope Museum itself. Let me demonstrate this with a few examples. I'm running one behind, excuse me. Some of the oldest objects in the collection of the museum came from Artis, the Amsterdam Zoo which is located only a few hundred meters from here. In fact, when we open the doors, we can almost hear the lion's roar. Artis was founded in 1838 as a place of science and leisure for the well-to-do citizens of Amsterdam. In addition to living animals, the zoo also collected ethnographic objects donated by members who traveled abroad. For Africa, the most important donations came from traders who worked in an area around the mouth of the Congo River. They were employees of a Dutch company, the New African Trade Association, who bought palm oil and ivory and sold and traded European artifacts in the opposite direction. One of these employees was Liewe Anema. Aged 23, Anema boarded his first Africa-bound ship in 1877 and returned finally to the Netherlands seven years later. During that period, Anima collected a number of important objects and donated them to artists, like the mask you see here. Another 19th century acquisition of artists is the Ndunga mask shown here, which you will recognize from the invitation card. 
the Ndunga mask has a Janus head. You see here the front and the back side, and a full feather costume. Anima collected a second, very similar mask. There are also two in Leiden in the museum and another two in Rotterdam. All very similar, possibly all from the same group or even maker. Again, we don't know. The objects of artists were shown in their own ethnographic museum. In fact, if you look closely at this photograph, very closely, uh, taken around 1890, you can see an Ndunga mask in the glass case on the far left. In the early 20th century, the management of the zoo started to doubt the sense of having an ethnographic museum. It was finally decided to donate the collection to the Colonial Institute that was founded in 1910. The objects came over in 1920. Many of them were from Indonesia, but there was also a substantial number from Africa. As the colonial museum was dedicated to Dutch colonies, the African objects were hardly shown. Even more, a substantial part was sold and exchanged to our fellow museum in Leiden in 1947. At that time, the, the museum still focused only on the East and West Indies. Only a few objects stayed behind, including this famous Chokwe couple. We regard this decision as a significant low point for the history of the Africa collections in this museum. Only three years later, in 1950, the Institute changed its policy. Indonesia was an independent nation now, and the museum was renamed Tropen Museum and decided to have an Africa department. If 1947 was a year of loss, it could also be seen as a year of rebirth. In the very same year, the museum received a loan a few of a few important objects from the collector Georg Tielman. These were later transformed in a donation by his son. From one of these objects, a fine and delicate Baule mask, we can reconstruct the pedigree in a detailed way. It was created in the early 1930s in the present-day Ivory Coast by a Baule Atutu master carver and purchased by Hans Himmelheber, a German ethnologist who collected objects and information for a thesis that appeared in 1935 under the title Neger Künstler. After an exhibition held in Frankfurt, the mask was bought by the Parisian dealer Charles Raton, who showed it in a famous exhibition in New York. Later, he sold the mask to Karel van Leer, an important pre-war modern art dealer and influential promoter of African and Oceanic art. And he sold it in his turn to Georg Thielmann, who loaned it to the Trope Museum. The backside of the mask showed traces of this turbulent history. After 1950, it became the task of museum curator Jager Gerlings to rebuild the Africa collection. There was a very limited acquisition fund. These were the years before the Bank Giro Loterij. And Jager Gerlings got most of his new acquisitions through exchanges with other West European museums and sometimes with art dealers. Objects from Indonesia and New Guinea were exchanged with ethnographic objects from Africa. This beautiful chocolate chair was one of the results. It was exchanged with the Ethnographical Museum in Antwerp. Only recently we found out that they bought it in 1920 from the Belgian art dealer Henri Parijn, who traded with sailors working on boats from the Congo which moored in the harbor of Antwerp. He was never in Africa. Through the energetic actions of Jager Gerlings, the first Africa department was opened in 1958. In the 1960s, the ideas changed about the kind of objects the Tropic Museum should collect. As part of the Tropic Institute, which at the time focused on supporting development of the recent independent nations in the South, the Trope Museum changed ideas on collecting. More and more, it was felt that the museum should primarily show how people lived in contemporary society. To collect the complete material culture of a population group on the spot was thought to be more relevant than collecting unique artifacts from European galleries. For Africa, a project was chosen on the Samo, a population group in Burkina Faso. Social anthropologist Jan Broekhuizen, who lived for many years among the Samo, studying development challenges, participated in a collecting trip together with museum curator Fritz Kovan in the late 1960s. It was the first, but also the last, substantial collecting field trip that the museum conducted in Africa. Many hundreds of household items were purchased with the specific purpose of presenting an image of daily life of the Samo people. The objects were used in an exhibition 
that was meant, as the poster said, to present an image of an African savannah people in development. The Outshorn collection, I mentioned it in my opening remarks, was acquired just a few years later. The two collections were based on opposite approaches. The Outshorn collection consists of a few dozen objects originating from all over Africa, chosen for their individual aesthetical qualities. The Samo collection consists of hundreds of objects from a very specific area, reflecting all the aspects of daily life chosen with a detailed knowledge of the society and focusing on development issues. In the 70s and 80s, the Samo approach ruled, we can say. Development cooperation became the guiding principle of the Trope Museum. The museum was radically transformed into an information center on development issues, concentrating on daily life of ordinary people. The new Trope Museum opened its doors in 1979. The Africa department was shaped by the first Africa curator, Harry Leighton, who was appointed in 1973. The work of the museum and its new curator focused on exhibitions, not so much on collecting. The outsourced purchase had exhausted the acquisition budget, and it was not that clear yet how the new, the new museum should collect. An exhibition in 1980, taken over from Berlin, introduced some new ideas. The title was Modern Art from Africa. But in fact, it contained a mix of all kinds of contemporary visual expressions, from painted barber signs, Shona stone sculptures, to autonomous artworks of, from several emerging art centers. On the poster, we see early works of Twin 77 and Shiri Samba, for instance. Many works of the exhibition could better be described as popular art. It seemed to be close to the heart of the Trope Museum, Indeed, throughout its existence, the museum always had the ambition to focus on contemporary society. It was never defined as an historical museum. The mission statement of the 70s stated that the museum focused on daily life of ordinary people in the third world. The challenge was how to translate such a vision into visual appealing objects. Popular art seemed to be an interesting field to explore although it was not until later that the museum started to collect popular art in earnest. Over the years, small collections were built up of paintings from various countries such as Ghana, Cameroon and Ethiopia. In the late 90s, we collected painted posters for the new emerging video film industry in Ghana and elsewhere. Birgit Meyer, one of our speakers tonight, did research on these films and helped us to collect. Various painted portraits came into the collection, introducing a whole new range of theoretical aspects such as presentation and self-presentation, identity and image. And very recently the museum purchased a substantial collection of so-called commemorative cloth, machine-made textiles designed and printed in Africa to commemorate specific occasions such as elections, celebrating 20 years of independence or 30 years of presidency, or a visit by the Pope of a, or a foreign head of state. These clothes were exhibited last year under the title Long Live the President. And finally, the most important acquisition probably, the collection of popular paintings from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, formerly owned and researched by Johannes Fabian, our keynote speaker of tonight, who will tell you more about it later this evening. The main part of that collection is a series of more than 100 paintings created in 1973 and 1974 by Chibumba Kande Matulu, who sold his paintings at that time on the streets of Lubumbashi. The collection is important to us, as Chimbumba painted many moments of the history of his country from his perspective, from before the Europeans appeared until well into the future, with most attention given to the years around independence. Another reason why it is important is the thorough way it has been researched and analyzed by Johannes Fabian, who had many detailed conversations with the maker himself. Finally, we got to know the maker. We usually define all these works under the banner of popular art or popular culture, a term that covers a wide range of urban-based images, of art forms that are produced and consumed by many, art forms that follow the pulse of broad parts of society, art forms which reflect popular notions on social and political issues, art forms without pretensions to make great art, art that is accessible, vital, dynamic, tensed, painful, humoristic, ever-changing, 
quickly rising, quickly disappearing, art that deals with relevant issues of contemporary society, art that is indeed full of popular imagination, always mixing fiction with a message. Apart from popular art and culture, the 1980 exhibition introduced the field of modern art as well. This topic has been discussed many times in the Trope Museum, on formal conferences in 1985 and 1993, in various internal debates on collection policy, but only quite recently it was decided to start collecting in an active way. Since that moment, the small collection of modern art is gradually expanding. In the choices made, we have tried to make links with existing collections or to topics that are relevant for the museum and the institute. This recent work, made by Semibiology, reflects in an uncanny way the historical paintings made by Chibu Makanda Matulu. The mines of Katanga were the reason for colonial expansion, for post-independent struggles over power, but are now left derelict. Balocci comments these events in his imaginative photo collages. Using different artistic means and with a different sensitivity, and in a new contemporary Africa, he shares the same critical view of history of his country as Chibumba. The most recent acquisition is Planets in My Head, literature, by artist Yinka Shonibare. Yinka Shonibare, born in Nigeria but educated and based in England, use, uses metaphors to draw our attention to colonial legacies in the present. His well-known use of so-called African prints is a clear example. These colorful textiles are commonly seen as African popular culture and a symbol of African identity, but originate from Dutch attempts in colonial times to mechanize Indonesian batiks. Dressed in a suit of a Victorian cut, the schoolboy comments on the idea of literature as a so-called Western field of knowledge. The planet map hat is covered with the names of famous non-Western authors a complex message compressed in one powerful sculpture. Art is strongly linked with imagination. It is a product of imagination and owes its appeal to the power to let us imagine things. We could put Chibumba in the box of popular imagination as he was firmly rooted in the society around him, and there were many painters like him producing similar works, but on the other hand, his individual choice and voice cannot be denied. Inka Shoni Bare is commonly seen as a unique individual artist, but also he uses popular culture and popular images very effectively in his works. And what about the classic works of art? Many people consider the Fang sculpture and the Ndunga mask as unique masterpieces of African art, of astounding imagination and aesthetical power. Still, they form part of a large group of very similar sculptures and masks. The works were recognized, evaluated and understood by a large part of society. The concept of popular imagination is intriguing, but complex. The works I have shown and the stories I have told can be found, with many more, in the book we present this evening, Africa at the Trope Museum, a product of several years of research and hard work for which I owe a big thanks, especially to my colleagues and co-authors, Sonja Weiss, for her thorough research and never-ending energy, and Daan van Dartel, photographer Irene de Groot, editor Alette van Kouwenhoven and a large number of other colleagues inside and outside the Trope Museum and Kit Publishers. I want to end with a personal note. Every collection reflects personal lives, personal decisions, personal recollections. This year we received a gift of a painting by the Nigerian artist Twins77. It was donated by a Dutch former engineer who worked for Shell in the 60s. I met him once, in 1987, when I had organized a small exhibition on Twin 77 in Rotterdam. He showed up a month after the opening. I own a painting of this artist, do you want to see it? Absolutely, I said. I admired the painting, this painting. It was an early work from the late 60s, very much vintage Twin 77. We had a nice talk together and I never saw him again. In the beginning of this year, he called me. He was retired now, lived in Portugal, and sought a good and safe home for his painting. He had remembered our meeting and had managed to find me. For me, it was a special donation. 
I saw works of twins in the 70s in a gallery in Amsterdam. I helped to hang his work on the exhibition Modern Art from Africa in 1980 when I worked here as an intern. I discussed his work with the legendary Uli Bayer, pioneer, writer and organizer in the field of modern African art who opened our exhibition in 1980. And finally, I met Twin77 himself in 1981 in Oshokbo, now 30 years ago, where I stayed in his house for a week and where I saw him work. Later on, I met him several times in the Netherlands, where he stayed with a collector or performed with his band. All these recollections came back to me this year, 2011, the year the Trope Museum received this painting, the year when Uli Bayer passed away, and also the year when Twin77 died, almost three months ago now, and the year we published this book. It made me aware again that everything we do in a museum becomes part of history, that everything changes, shifts, becomes memory. Collecting becomes recollecting. A collection is a living and growing organism, full of stories and an everlasting source of new interpretations, something to guard and cherish and not to sell. There is at least one other person here tonight who shares the last personal recollections I just mentioned. That person is Harry Leighton, my predecessor, the first Africa curator at the Trope Museum. He is here, and it is my great pleasure and honor to hand over to him the very first copy of the book, Africa at the Trope Museum. Harry, can you stand up, please? Now, here is she done. <laughs> Paul, thank you very much. I feel honored uh, to be presented with this uh, magnificent book. <coughs> In your uh, speech and presumably also in, in your book, you have given a very unexpected analysis of the history of the Tropen Museum because you chose as your perspective the history of the acquisition policies of collections, which is not a common thing to do. The Samo collection the Outhorn collection, the acquisition of modern art, especially the Johannes Fabian collection, all of them mark the changing parameters of the museum, this museum, in modern times. And when I thought of it, I must say, I would like to <coughs> match this collection perspective with another perspective which is probably more common and more familiar to our visitors in the Tropen Museum, uh, the perspective as uh, taken from, from the policies of the exhibitions. As you rightly remarked, Paul, in the 1970s and 80s, the emphasis was on, on development cooperation and the exhibitions which we had at the time followed suit. They were on developmental problems, agriculture, the economics of rural areas in Africa, problems of healthcare. I think of the exhibitions we had on breastfeeding and leprosy. Um, also, the, the problems of political nature. Think of the exhibitions we have had here against the apartheid regime in South Africa. On race relations. Think of the exhibition White on Black. All of these show, I would say, manifest a shift from the traditional exhibition that you can find it in many museums of all over the world, to a unique position which this museum has held over the past 50 years, 
not only within the world of the museums of ethnography, but also in the uh, society of this country as a whole, socially, economically, politically. And I think, Paul, to, it must be a privilege for you, it was for me, and I'm sure it is for many who are working here, a privilege to be working here in this wonderful museum. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you.